Achtung, Millwall. Hello, dear listeners. Welcome to Achtung Mill, a short edition, a special Boxing Day short. I'm sitting here in the post-Christmas day uh, quiet of the house as we all, you know, recover from <clears throat> yesterday's festivities. Um, and it just occurred to me, um, no football on Christmas Day, big football day, Boxing Day. I'm speaking to you ahead of the Lions trip to, to Watford, to Vicarage Road at 12 o'clock. I'm going to try and see if I can do a very, very quick, short edition. Get it out before then. Can I be done? I don't know. I'm going to give it a try. Anyway, it just struck me. Um, Christmas Day football used to be quite a big thing. It sounds very odd to the modern ear. Um, but as far as the... Even at the early 60s, um, Christmas Day matches, football league matches were played across the country. It was, it was quite a common thing. It seems to fade away from the six, mid-60s onwards. I'm going to presume that was with the rise of Christmas Day as a full-on bank holiday. Maybe it never used to be seen as such religious holiday, obviously, but not maybe a full bank holiday in the conventional sense. Certainly uh, the last uh, fixtures I'm, I read ended as late as 1965. That was a, a Blackburn game against Blackpool, Christmas Day 1965. Uh, apparently it was even attempt they tried to revive the tradition in the 1980s I'm reading from the Daily Star here listeners I have an article on, on said matter uh, Brentford and Wimbledon were going to play a game in the early 1980s which was um, nixed by fan pressure so it never really made a comeback modern days you've got problems with travel you've got no rail service you've got no public transport um, and the, you know it, it does sound very odd to the modern ear but I just wondered when the last time that Millwall played on Christmas Day was. These are the things that cross my mind on quiet Boxing Day mornings. And as far as I can determine, the last game that we played on the Boxing Day was in 1958, two years before I was born, December the 25th. It was a fourth division match, Millwall nil, Chester City won in front of 9,260 at Cold Blow Lane, uh, so defeat. Maybe that's why we stopped playing on Christmas Day, because it would continue, as I've said, into the early 60s, uh, mid-60s. Um, but we last played on Christmas Day in 1958. Uh, our team that day, I'm hoping some of these names will be familiar to some of our older listeners. You've got Reg the Cat Davis in goal. Uh, two fullbacks, Harold Redmond and Ray Brady. Shown as T. Brady, but Ray Brady. As the fullback, the half back line, Bob Humphreys, Dave Harper, father of course of Frank Harper, Colin Rawson, then the front line, Joe Broadfoot, who used to be a match day host, I believe, at the den quite until quite recently. Uh, Joe Joe Hutton, Alec Moyes, Ron Heckman, and Alan Crowshaw. So there it was. That was the last Christmas Day fixture. That would leave us in the fourth division, bottom tier of, of English football at this point, under the management of Jimmy Seed, I think was the manager at this stage. Let me just check that, because I've done minimal research into this, listeners. Let's have a quick look and see who it was uh, in management at that point. So to test my knowledge of Millwall, it was indeed Jimmy Seed. Um, short spurt of management, 1957, uh, 58 and then 58, 59 season, which is the one in, in question. Um, we would finish in fourth, uh, ninth position in the fourth division that season. So we didn't get promoted. We were just above mid-table respectability. A couple of places behind Crystal Palace, also in the fourth division at this stage. The uh, teams promoted Port Vale were champions, Coventry City, York City and Shrewsbury Town. And in the bottom four, this would all be um, pretty standard re-election times then. You got re-elected. There was no transfer as there is in the modern... Uh, system of, of you know promotion pretty much between the National League, non-leagues and the Football League. Back then you had a pretty strong expectation that you'd get re-elected if you finished in the bottom four of the fourth division. One or two wouldn't. In fact, one one of the bottom four, there was Oldham, 
order shot would fade. I think they went out of business. I think they were relegated into the National League and then went out of business and came back as a Phoenix club. I'll have to do another bit of research into Aldershot. Uh, I think it's Aldershot Town now, isn't it? Uh, Barrow. Barrow have, um, had a, they, they were voted out of the league in the very early 70s. I think it was 1970. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, listeners. Check your check your records. Make sure I'm, I'm speaking entirely off the top of my head here. And another team here, Southport, also voted out. I think Southport in the mid seventies, something like that. Um, anyway, they were the bottom four. They would be re-elected on this occasion. Uh, top scorer for the Lions in this fifty eight fifty nine season uh, would be Ron Heckman with twelve goals, followed by Joe Hutton with ten goals. So I thought, as per these kinds of random fixtures, and this is not random fixtures. This is like a a curiosity fixture, really, it's a different different concept. I've picked out three um, names. I did do a little bit of research. Not, not every tangent that crosses my mind as I waffle away. But I've picked out Reg Davis, Reg, known as the Cat. Reg Davis in goal, goalkeeper, 1958 to 63. Played 218 games. He was born in Tipton, uh, October 1933, various clubs across his career, including West Bromwich Albion as a, an amateur, National Service, Royal Artillery, Walsall, Millwall, then uh, Romford, Leighton Orient, Port Vale, and then Leighton Orient again. Um, I'll just read, this is from Neil's wonderful, masterful, get it, buy it, the who's who of Millwall history. Uh, the muscular Reg was once suspended following a brawl with a Workington forward when home fans jumped the fence to assault him. He made for the dressing room without asking the referee if he could leave the pitch. Uh, he was an excellent goalkeeper and one of Mill's greatest since the Second World War, arriving at the club from Walsall for £500. That's a different era of transfer fee, listeners, isn't it? Uh, after the Football League initially refused to accept his registration uh, when the Saddlers, Walsall, declined to release him. He won the fourth division title with the Lions in 1962. He would get promoted later in the early 60s and then worked at Jersey Airport for British Airways and British Midland Airways. Uh, during his stay at the den, he ran a paraffin business with Joe Broadfoot. He later lived in Thailand and Cambodia, so he must have retired out to the Southeast Asia. Um, that's wonderful. I have a sense that uh, Dennis Burnett and Harry Cripps ran a paraffin business, paraffin for heating, for the younger listeners. Paraffin heaters. This is the era before central heating. Um, but it, this was clearly a thing to provide a bit of income for players um, running a paraffin business. So there we are. We've, and I picked out the already mentioned Joey Broadfoot, uh, an outside right. Uh, 273 games, 66 goals for Mill across two spells, 1958-64 and then 1966-67. Lewisham boy, born in 1940. Career taking in various non league clubs. Millwall in 1958, Ipswich uh, sold there for £16,000. 16, 16, not 60, 16 in October 1963. Northampton, Millwall, and Ipswich again to complete his career. Joe uh, became Jimmy Seed's first signing as Millwall manager for signing fee of 10 one pound notes. This is wonderful detail, isn't it? He signed, he was signed from. Um, team called Metropolitan Athletic, non-league side, I guess. I've not heard of them. For a fee of 10 individual £1 notes, it sounds like. That's good. He only missed two games when Mill took out the Division 4 title in 1961-2, but in 1963, Ipswich paid 16000 for him to go to Portman Road before moving on to then the first division, Northampton Town. He was brought back to the Den in July 1966, but after a falling out with Benny Fenton, uh, this hastened another move back to Ipswich the following February. He later drove a cab and has various job and business interests, the last, last of which was a car cleaning business. Niche. I'm sure he did a bit of match day hosting at the Den not that long ago. In the last, well, in the last 10, 15, 20 years or so, anyway. Um, we've already mentioned our top scorer for this season was Ron Heckman with 12 goals. So I thought I'd pick out Ron Heckman because that's a name I'd... I'd I hadn't come across before. Don't, you know, nobody knows everything and I try and do my best, but I hadn't come across his name. So Ron Heckman played for Millwall 1957 to 60, 
quite uh, pictures of players back then. They would have looked older. He was uh, not born in 1929, so he would have been about, what, 30? He looks like he's about 60. I've probably, I hope none of Ron's family listen because it sounds a bit unflattering. I just think everyone in these old black and white, maybe it was a Times, everyone looked aged before their time, I don't know. Born in 1929. Uh, played 104 games for us, 26 goals, 1957 to 60. Passed away in uh, Bracknell, 1990. Uh, played for South or Hayes, Bromley, Leighton Orient, Millwall, Crystal Palace, Bedford, and then went to uh, Dorking, and then went to Ghana to coach, and Kuwait. Uh, Peckham born Ron was an England amateur international, Ron Heckman, and played for the Athenian League and the Middlesex Wanderers before turning professional at the comparatively late age of 25 with late... No, you don't get that so much now, players having a non-league career and turning professional. I suppose Steve Morrison, to some extent, will be one of the more recent examples, but it's not as common a thing. Ian Wright did the same, didn't he, when he uh, joined Arsenal... Uh, Crystal Palace, sorry, then went on to Arsenal. Um, he won the Division 3 South um, title with, with late Orient, an FA up Amateur Cup winner with Bromley, and in 1949, he arrived at the Den to beef up the forward line, but was used more as a midfielder. He would later work for Midland Bank in Fred Eagle Street in the city of London till his death after a heart attack. Um, I did find a few, um, the two games we, we, we drew at Chester, the way they used to do the fixtures, and we had a Christmas Day fixture, 25th obviously, and we played Chester again in the away leg, the away leg, the away fixture. Um, two days later, on the 27th. That was a nil-nil draw at Sealand Road. I've not found a match report for this Christmas Day fixture. Not much press. I suppose that was another thing, wasn't it? Christmas Day, no papers. And it, the game wasn't reported on, that I've found, on the um, uh, the 27th, the next uh, wave of papers printed. So there's no, I have no report for the, the loss at the Den. I do have a, a people report for the nil-nil draw two days later. At Sealand Road in Chester. Uh, this is 0 0. Mill will rescue a point, says the, the people. A strong Mill defence with goalkeeper Reg Davis outstanding and weak finishing by Chester saved the Londoners a point. Time and again, the short passing Chester forwards worked the ball into the Mill goal mouth, but they failed to t- accept their chances. Mill had a lucky escape when fullbacks Roy Brady and Harold Redmond each kicked off the line. Mill's attacks were spasmodic. Mm-hmm. And carried little real threats. Tell me what's new in this life, listeners. Apart from some good work by left winger Alan Croshaw, their best effort was reserved for two minutes before the end when a rising shot from inside forward, inside left, Ron Heckman, the man again, brought the best save of the game from Chester's deputy goalkeeper Keith Griffiths. So there we are. That's um, that's from the uh, the people. Um, as ever. We would like to look at the front page news. So, as I said already, that the Lions would finish in ninth position in Division Four that season. But we'll have a quick look at the uh, the front page of the people, just to keep you a bit of a sense of um, the life and times of our club and what what was going on in the world around us. Um, so, this is the the people. Sunday, December the twenty eighth. That's where the, that report was just come from. Uh, regarding the nil-nil draw, there's a report um, the Russians are threatening to smash Britain. There's nothing new in this life, is there? Uh, Russia lashed out last night with an amazing threat to smash Britain in the first hour of an atomic war. Um, Moscow Radio said Britain particularly would receive a smashing retaliatory blow on, the very, blow on the very first day, if not the first hour, if NATO allies tried to attack the Russian bloc. Marshal Sokolovsky said we'd be gone brown bread inside the first hour. I don't think anything has changed on that front since. Um, banner headline of the people, the pound is going to war. The government has thrown the pound into the battle to boost Britain's trade. Uh, some kind of foreign foreign exchange change by the Treasury, uh, the, which declared its faith in the strength of sterling. Um, one thing you do notice doing these kinds of history um, shows, listeners, is they are the same stories seem to be going round and round the national psyche um, ever since. There's a football story on the front page here. Uh, Luton trainer, uh, so yeah, co- met coach or whatever, Frank King was interviewed by a police inspector after yesterday's match of Arsenal. Arsenal supporters complained 
that the said Frank King had doused them with a bucket of water. He'd slung water over some Arsenal fans. He wouldn't have got away with that, that Danny. He'd have had a brawl on his hands, wouldn't he? The coppers are interviewing him. Um, he says they're a bit touchy. And finally, dear listeners, uh, Maria Callas, the fiery soprano operatic singer. I don't know why I'm putting that voice on. Uh, she's entered a lawsuit claiming a thousand pound plus from the Rome Opera House because she was barred from the stage after walking out of a gala performance. Famous diva Maria Callas. She used to live on Lake Garda, so I know that because we went on holiday there once and did one of those little boat rides around the lake. And her house was pointed out, La Casa de Maria Callas. And finally, if you've got a cough, you want thamel syrup, which gave amazing relief, says Mrs. D. Belam of Woodford Green in Essex, who's tried many different medicines for her young daughter's stubborn cough and then stumbled upon thamel syrup. And it did the job, she says, available from chemists. For only two and nine, four shillings or seven and nine. I'm going to leave that hanging for younger listeners to know what I'm talking about. Two and nine, four shillings, seven and nine. No explanation. Not going to tell you what that means at all. There we are. Last time we played a Christmas Day fixture was in 1958, Christmas Day. The Lions nil, Chester City won. Hope you've enjoyed this little impromptu, very short, very ill-prepared edition of Achtung Millwall. Have a happy Christmas. Have a great one. It's over three points later today. I might be... That, that, that might come back to haunt me by the time you get to listen to this. But until then, dear listeners, from myself, Nick Hart, signing out for Christmas. Have a good one. Enjoy. Peace and love. Nick Hart signs out. Arrivederci Millwall. Bye for now. Achtung. Millwall.